Hi. We're oh. glad to see you, Maddie. <laughs> oh yeah, I wouldn't have missed us for the world. Well, good. Okay, um, I think I'm going to start talking to get us going, and people are still arriving, but that's okay. So, um, it. Why do you think that is? Let's see. I heard a voice. Cindy Chesbro needs her microphone turned off. Okay, Ooh. I'm going to start welcoming people here. I see lots of fun people at this program, and we're going to have a good evening. So welcome to the December 2020 evening program of the North Coast chapter of the California Native Plant Society. We are one of 35 chapters of CNPS that covers the state and Baja California. And we're part of a great organization that brings together science, conservation, education, and horticulture to save native plants. That's what we're all about. So that's what we're here for tonight too. So I'm Carol Ralph, currently president of our chapter. And I saw some others of our, um, of our steering committee here, like Greg O'Connell, who's um, our rare plant co-chair and Karen Issa, is our merchandise sales person. And let's see, I don't remember who else is here that has a title, but um, it takes a lot of people to run a chapter and we've got a lot of good help. So um, first I thought I'd review Zoom etiquette, which a lot of you know, probably some of you know it better than I do, but it's always good to review. So you keep your microphone on mute unless you're going to talk. And the new trick that I've just learned is if you want to just speak briefly, um, you press on your space bar and hold it down while you talk. But at this meeting, you will only talk if we call on you, right? And there, you'll have a chance. You can be thinking about whether you have any plant observations you want to share. That'll be your chance to test your unmute. Um, the second thing is uh, you can choose whether to keep your video on or off. Sometimes speakers like to be able to see their audience, the faces in their audience. So um, it makes it a more real experience. Hi, Jen. Seems like I could see Jen arriving. And uh, you can, well, but if you don't want people to see that the uh, clutter in your house, that's okay too. So you choose. Um, and then we're going to use the chat feature. Uh, when I ask for plant observations, you'll use your chat to fill in about bubbles saying that you have an observation. And then Andrea will be watching the chats and she'll call on you. And that's when you will unmute to tell us your plant observation, okay? And then you can also use your chat um, during, during and after our speakers to ask the speakers questions, okay? So uh, next, I'm gonna share my screen to show people the yes, I would like feature that's a standard, oh, whoops can't do this. Can you make, Andrea, can you give me screen share power? Yeah. Okay, the yes I would like is a list of things that you can do if you want to participate in CMPS or even just keep track of what we're doing. And you'll see in a minute, it says, yes, I would like to um, get messages about CMPS activities like field trips and evening programs. So you're a co-host now, you can share. Okay, so here's my screen, share. And I just need to make it bigger. There, are you seeing it? Yeah. Okay, so you can be notified by email of things. And if you want to do that, you write to me, send me an email or you can phone me and I'll send you an invitation to uh, that Yahoo group where we send our messages. If you want to help grow native plants for our plant sale, 
Uh, we have a nursery. It's entirely volunteer run, and we're pretty proud of all the plants that we're growing there. We have volunteer work days. You can contact our nursery manager at this email address. And while you're looking at that email address, that is how you can ask somebody whether we have for sale a certain plant. And um, you know, if you want a particular thing, you can ask about it there. You can also go look at our website at the plant sale page, and that will give you clues. But um, you should also remember that if you want to buy native plants during any time of year between our sales, you can go to the Neyland Glen farm stand that's at Freshwater Farms, right near Freshwater Corners. And they're open 12 to six every day. And we have our plants on, a, on some, a set of shelves there. And we put, we put a nice selection of things that are looking good. So you can buy our native plants there. Then if you would like some help deciding what native plants to plant in your yard or somebody to identify some things in your yard so that you know whether they're invasive or not, you can ask for our consultation service, our native plant consultation. And you do that by contacting Melanie Johnson at, that, at those numbers. Okay, and then since this is Christmas time, you might want to be buying presents and we have merchandise, which we normally sell at our evening programs, but uh, we can't do that. But Karen Issa, our mer merchandise sales person, is willing to show you what we have and talk to you and uh, have you come to her house to pick things up. And she lives in Eureka and there's her email address. And we have t-shirts, long sleeve and short sleeve in a couple different colors. We have posters of Humboldt Bay Area butterflies and of the CMPS posters of plants. We have Michael Kaufman's three major books and uh, Jim Smith and John Stewart's books book. And we have garden signs that you can put in your garden saying native plants grow here. Then for anything else, please contact me. If you would like to help organize our programs, we need a new program chair. And if you enjoy these programs and would like to help make them happen, we want to hear from you. Also, if you would like to speak at one of our programs, we would like to hear from you. And you can write me or call me at those numbers. Okay. So stop share. And uh, so now we're ready to ask, has anybody seen any good plants in the last month? Andrea, has anybody sent a chat saying they want to share something? Not yet, let's give them a second. Okay, while you guys are remembering what cool plants you've seen, I'll tell you my favorite plant from this last month was at the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands, that new conservation property that Friends of the Dunes has and is now open to the public, right out on the water line pipe, the water line trail that, that goes parallel to the beach right inside the dunes, I found a really fresh, wonderful patch of grape fern. Then it used to be Botrychium and now it's Septridium multifidum. It's a fern that's fresh and green at this time of year and it was shedding its spores. It's kind of like it thinks it's spring, but it, that's what it does in the fall. And I recommend that as a place for people to go to walk. Anybody else? Either the technology is impeding people or everybody's really shy. I hope, it, I hope this doesn't mean you haven't been outside. Okay, next month I want to hear lots of reports. So um, at this point I'll proceed I assume Maddie is ready. Oh yeah, okay. Um, we're going to have three speakers tonight. Our December program usually is uh, 
uh, potpourri of people who have shorter things than our, than our normal programs. So this is a fun one. We're gonna have first have Maddie talk about lupin germination, and then we're gonna have Tony show us spring flowers, and then we'll have Sydney show us some cool plants without chlorophyll. So first, uh, Maddie is a graduate student at Humboldt State University studying fire ecology with Jeffrey Kane. And she came to our chapter and asked for a little bit of monetary support to do a fun little side project. And that's what she's gonna tell us about tonight. Okay, so unmute yourself, Maddie. All right, cool. Okay, All you're right. on. Yay, okay, I'm starting my timer, here we go. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of the screen sharing action. Bear with me here, everyone. Oh, I need to be um, named as a co-host first before I can do screen sharing, it looks like. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Carol, you're on mute. Perfect. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start now. Hi, everyone. My name is Maddie. Today, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my research regarding the role of fire in the germination of the Lassix lupin, also known as Lupinus constantii. A little bit about the Lassix lupin. Um, this is actually one of my personal favorite members of Fabaceae. It's a small native lupin um, with an inflorescence of about three to five centimeters, and it typically blooms in July. It grows close to the ground in cespitose clusters and is a short-lived perennial that can live up to about 12 years. This beautiful plant is actually one of California's rarest endemics um, with a population that consists of only about 400 reproductive individuals left. It's earned itself a plant rank of 1B.1, meaning that this plant is seriously endangered in California. Given its state, the Lassix lupin is protected at the state level and is currently a candidate for listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act. This exceedingly small population is divided among two peaks, um, Mount Lassic and Red Lassic, found in the Lassic's mountain range of the Six Rivers National Forest. And a little bit about the site. Um, so the Lassix is a really cool area. Um, it's actually a special interest location and it's designated as one, a botanical area, and two, as a geologic area. So the soil makeup is incredibly unique. It's comprised of serpentinized ultramafic soils from three different parent materials. Additionally, um, you know, this area, the, basically these plants, they're enduring an extremely harsh environment with rocky and somewhat steep slopes around 12 to 30%. Um, and given its unique soil makeup, this area also hosts other rare plants. Um, this area also historically experienced fire. A fire scar study performed across the Six Rivers National Forest revealed that prior to fire exclusion, um, this area had a historic mean fire return interval of 12.7 or about every 13 years. Um, and these fires were typically surface fires. The fire return interval, however, may have been a bit longer on the serpentinized soils, uh, just because you know there isn't as much vegetation there or uh, fuel, as we like to call it, to burn in the area that the Lassic Lupin inhabit. Additionally, this area was managed by fire by the Athabascans Lassix tribe until their removal in 1862. Um, and since then, this area hasn't really seen much fire. So uh, we began excluding fire around 1910. And since then we've had the Lassix fire, which happened in 2015. And prior to that, there was only one other fire in 1953. And some challenges that the Lassix Lupin has been facing, you know, we know that climatic conditions are changing. They're warming currently and new conditions are being created. And as these new conditions are created, uh, suitable plant habitats may actually shift and threaten the persistence to native plant diversity. 
as in, um, and also due to fire exclusion, uh, we can see that conifers and shrubs have rapidly encroached the lupins habitat in the Lassix mountain range. So here I've actually included a picture. This was the top one was taken in 1930. This is the black and white picture all the way over to the right here. Um, and then the same exact picture taken again in 2008. So if you look closely at that, you can see on the right side that those conifers by 2008 have rapidly made their way upslope. They're actually almost near the peak of Mount Lassic. Um, additionally, on the left side, you can see that that tree line has densified quite a lot. Um, and on top of that, the vegetation cover on that slope face has greatly expanded. And you can see that even just by looking at that picture. And so as the encroachment expands, the suitable habitat for deer mice and other small mammals expand with it. Um, as these deer mice inhabit closer regions to the Lassix lupin, they have greater potential for seed predation. And granivory has been a huge problem for the Lassix lupin, as it's currently their greatest threat to persistence. Thankfully though, around 2006, US Forest Service decided to step in and start protecting these rare seeds by caging the robust fruiting plants. And it was really cool this summer, I actually had the opportunity to get out there with the uh, Forest Service and help cage these plants. And what we would do is we would essentially select the best plants, the ones that Maddie, can you hear me? Um, sorry, everyone. I know Maddie's having uh, connection troubles. I told her earlier in the presentation to try downloading to her phone. So maybe she can rejoin us on her phone app. Maybe uh, we could pause her presentation and start with the next speaker, with Tony. I'm here if you need me. All right, let's start with you and I'll get a hold of Maddie. We'll start hers back up when we can. Okay, I'll, I'll introduce Tony real quick. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, so uh, we've interrupted Maddie. Our second speaker is Tony LaBanca who was actually a long time ago, a president of our chapter. So he's famous for that. And since then, he has spent a long time defending our plants and our fish from his positions at California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which he just recently left. So we're looking at the new relaxed pony and he's also been very important as one of our reliable collectors for the Wildflower Show for many years. And he's gonna share with us the route that he collects, which you'll see why he wants to go back to it every year. Okay, Tony. Thanks, Carol. Am I ready to share? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, she says. Uh... Let's see if we can get it there. Ta -da. How's that look? Beautiful. Well, hello everyone. Thanks for inviting me, Carol. And thanks for everybody being here. I, I know that uh, 
this is often challenging. And as we saw, there's a little bit of technical difficulty. So yeah, Tony Labanca, I've been a member of the chapter in various capacities for over 30 years now. And I appreciate uh, being invited today to share some of my highlights of what I experienced on the um, Wildflower Show uh, collecting route that I have. Um, every year I have helped organize as well as now Laurel Goldsmith has helped organize uh, the collectors for the wildflower show last year, because we were sheltering in place at the time, we needed to find some other way to share what we all enjoy sharing with people. So we went out and we all took photographs of the things that we normally would collect. This is uh, some highlights from that trip. And uh, I'll just jump off here. The wildflower show is a yearly event that we have and people uh, come to see over three, 400 species that we collect. And um, this is just one little snapshot I'm going to show you of uh, what it's like to go out and maybe see uh, uh, some of the things uh, that we collect and bring together for everyone uh, to look at every uh, end of April, beginning of May. Uh, my route starts in Garberville. I head down early in the morning, uh, start uh, heading my way towards Alder Point on Alder Point Road, work a little bit of, I'm going to try this pointer out, how's this? work the, the uh, area around the, the Harris area, work my way down to Alder Point and cross the Eel River, uh, head out to the Xenia Bluffs, and then up into Six Rivers National Forest, and in Shaw Valley, and by then it's getting pretty dark for me. I've collected all day long and I've got a truck full of specimens to share with all you folks, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long, exciting day. And, uh, I, this is what I saw this year. Some of the habitats I, I typically typically go through uh, include things that you guys are all familiar with, Oregon White Oak, Oak Woodland, Douglas Fir Woodland Forest, uh, Alliances, uh, Coastal Prairie, Mixed Evergreen Forest, Mixed Conifer Forest, things that you guys see pretty regularly whenever you head out past the Redwood Curtain into the, into the other parts of our coast range. Of course, uh, I try to emphasize uh, trying to find different species. So I'm gonna check riparian and wetland areas and all those habitats and make sure I poke around all the rock outcrops too because how else am I gonna find different things if I keep looking in the same place? So I'm always keying in on different types of habitats and little uh, elements of those habitats are gonna give me diversity. Heading up out of Garberville, um, the Alder Point Road is, is steep and it's got a good mix of uh, prairie and oak woodland. Uh, there's a little bit of encroaching uh, conifer here and there, but for the most part, many of these areas are in pretty good shape. I see a lot of annuals underneath, uh, out in the prairies and uh, plenty of species underneath the oaks as well. White oak, Oregon white oak is the common species there. Right off the bat, peas. Uh, there's a lot of early peas and I see two, two vetches pretty commonly. This is from this year, of course. Everything I'm gonna show you now is, uh, from two, is from 2020. It can change yearly. yearly. We see different types of weather, and different types of rainfall. And uh, what you see this year is just a snapshot. It will, it will always be different when you're a collector uh, heading out. Um, American vetch, a perennial. It's uh, a native plant that we uh, see pretty regularly in lots of places. And then the uh, four seeded pea as well here. Couple annuals, the, the leptosiphons, there's a couple of them out there, but I tend to see this most commonly by color, the true baby star, but uh, Nemophilus menziesii is common in most uh, uh, woodlands that you guys will experience. And then a couple perennials. Calicordis is relatively easy to find, but uh, oftentimes they occur in great numbers uh, on this road in certain places. And uh, trying to harvest a few so that we get a good collection is always something that I'm trying to, to find some nice ones. And then a lot of fav a lot of people have this favorite is the common wood star, the lithophragma. Uh, definitely something that you find generally underneath the oaks, not out in the open prairie, and another perennial. Predominantly, the, the lupin that you see on rocky slopes is Lupinus albifrons, the silver bush lupin. It's got that really distinct grape soda smell. When you're on a warm day on the Alder Point Road, you can smell this thing uh, driving by and you know, screech on the brakes, head to that rocky out, outcrop, 
or the rocky slope that you're looking at. You had a good bundle for Carol. Carol likes to fill some of the vases with lots of beautiful plants so that people get a good feel for the room. And this is one of those things that occurs in such large numbers that you can pick lots of inflorescences and, and fill a good picture. It's pretty much the most common lupin you're gonna see on the entire route all the way from Garberville uh, up into the forest. Wet areas, of course, uh, might have uh, plenty of limnanthes, typically this snow white metaphone. Lots of insects, there'll be lots of pollinators visiting this. It's a, it's a typically in wet years, it's pretty exciting to see great swaths of it across the prairie in, in those wet depressions. Same thing with red maids. In a wet year, you'll see plenty of these scattered across the prairie. As I head up the slopes and uh, across the prairies and oak woodlands, I also see a lot of mixed evergreen forest. And that's when you reach the top in this area here towards Harris, I'll usually take a little detour off the Old Point Road and head uh, towards Harris before I turn around and then come back to the to the Alder Point Road. There's a lot of interesting stuff out in the mixed evergreen forest, especially when you look at the mesic areas. Those mesic areas sometimes open through uh, selective harvests or sometimes clear cuts, and we can find a whole bunch of species coming out under there, uh, typically perennials, but there's annuals as well. We'll see plenty of uh, wild strawberry, lots of iris in some year. They kind of tend to be uh, this faded white, but oftentimes can be kind of a lemon golden yellow as well. And then, of course, a lot of people's favorite are these canyon larkspurs, the delphiniums. After passing through Alder Point, crossing the Eel River, you make the climb up to the Xenia Bluffs. Lots of uh, open and a little bit of prairie scattered through there. But once you hit this area, you tend to be in this mixed evergreen. The, we leave the oak, or the white oak behind and we get a lot more canyon live oak. We get steep slopes, which have these fascinating rock gardens. They're not highly diverse, but they have a lot of species that uh, are interesting to us and that we cannot see in every year. Of course, sedum is common throughout the area. And our favorite monk, perennial monkey flower and those woolly sunflowers that are so bright and cheery. We see them uh, at just about every rock out crop or town slope. Plenty of umbels, particularly these desert parsleys. We'll see another one later. This one's woolly fruit. It's, it's uh, grayish. You, you can really sticks out amongst uh, a lot of the deep green that's out there. And then of course, there's lots of annuals scattered amongst the rocks in a moist location. You might find this tomcat clover blooming prolifically. It's a lot of fun. And then of course, Eriogonum. How could you go anywhere in California without seeing a lot of this uh, genus? And uh, here you have uh, this arrow leaf buckwheat. I provided a little bit of assistance this year to some folks down at uh, UC San Diego with the California poppy uh, research that's going on down there. And I realize now how difficult it is to find a native stand of California poppy. I always knew it was hard, but after trying to find native poppies uh, this summer in a bunch of locations for those folks to do some genetic work on, I'm now convinced, uh, you know, most of what we see along any roadside is typically something that's been introduced from a garden habitat or from by Caltrans. There's a lot of poppies out there and a lot of them come from our actions. Once you go through the Xenia Bluffs and climb the hill a little further, you uh, pass the Xenia store and make a left and start to head north through Six Rivers National Forest. The area is turned decidedly in elevation and vegetation change there. And typically in some years, you'll find that this is where I'll get a little bit of spring snow. This is in 2007. And uh, that year was probably a, a, a poor collection year. You had to kind of stop and not find much after you hit Xenia. Um, some years uh, it, it's beautiful and green up there. You start to see the change to uh, a Douglas fir dominated forest with uh, ponderosa pine and other species, but uh, we start to see significant understories of shrubs and small trees such as the um, dogwood and lots of cool uh, early spring wildflowers. The moringa, the primula, 
and the snakula. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody's favorite, we see a lot of Calypso bulbosa in the Doug Douglas fir forests. And in openings, the, the Senecio, it's a very interesting one. It's got these great petals that kind of go in all different directions. Moving through Six Rivers National Forest, you pop out near Head and Shaw Valley, and some of those areas are dominated by chaparral. And the shrubs that I typically see, besides manzanita, that are blooming at this period are serviceberry and two C and Othis, the deer brush and the buck brush. Poking through that white middle canopy are oftentimes fritillarias, areas, and you'll be looking and looking for wildflowers and these guys are well camouflaged amongst the shrubs trying to avoid being eaten by the deer. At first my mind is like whoa it's a lily but it's you know I should know better it's early spring I'm never gonna find a, a, you know too many lilies that early and I know darn well what this is it's a fritillaria but I, my mind plays a little game with me when I see those colors. It's a it's a beauty and uh, it, like I suggest typically you're gonna find those in the in the densest thick of thick of this deer brush and scrape yourself up getting in there but they're well protected underneath some of those shrubs you're going to find another lomatium this is the fern leaf, leaf desert parsley uh, not as woolly a lot brighter and these scutellarias they're kind of interesting they have a, a, a significant tuber under, underground but they're a small little plant only about three four inches that bright purple tubular flower just sticking right out at you these are commonly fire followers, and sometimes you'll find them in uh, areas that have burned. A little more mesic areas uh, in those shrubby spots are going to have uh, the diplicus, lots of purple, small, little annual on the ground. And, and sometimes you'll find a good collection of fond lilies, usually California at that elevation. Once you pass Head and Shaw, you start to head downhill down the Van Dusen. In the headwater of the Van Dusen, there's great violet hunting in that area. Typically, I can find four or five species for the show. The more common viola globella, the stream violet, and then what's common in parts of California, Shelton's violet, that we don't see much of it, but it's found across the state. The goosefoot violet, purpurea. Douglas's violet, which just kind of catches the distribution of the, that southeast corner of Humboldt County. Not really common around here, but uh, another beautiful, striking violet. And a coastal violet, ocelata, western heart's ease. If for some reason you feel like you want to collect plants, you want to talk to Laurel Goldsmith. She's the new coordinator of the collectors every year. There's some contact for you. My route is this Garberville to Alder Point and then the Van Dues in the High and Palm Zinia area. I've done that route. I've done lots of either other routes as well. They're all fun. You can pick your own. You can create one. You can pick one that's already done. I encourage you to help us out. Of course, we don't know whether we're going to be collecting this year. Maybe we'll do photos again. Maybe we'll be lucky and we'll be able to gather again. Anyway, thanks for listening and thanks for taking a little trip with me. Thank you, Tony. That was beautiful. I especially like the violet collection. Me too. I told a bunch of people about that and I have uh, gotten good feedback and people have gone and checked out the upper Van Dusen, the headwaters of the Van Dusen, and I encourage you all to check it out uh, uh, late April, most of May. It's a lot of fun. So um, from what you've seen of the Het and Shaw Valley, would you worry what if you knew that people were setting up cannabis farms there? Um, yeah, the valley proper has its own, you know, distinct flora and set of plants. I don't think a lot of people have studied that area, but um, I, you know, being 
only mildly familiar with the project and I don't know where exactly it's situated. Yeah, I mean, we'd wanna know what kind of uh, resources could be impacted there and what kind of, get a better, better understanding of the flora and its rare components and special other special components. Yeah, we'd wanna know a lot more about what's happening there and how uh, those things could be protected or uh, avoided in some way. And so, yeah, I think information is what's always important in this process. Right. We need, we need to get out there. Okay. Um, so are we ready to uh, go back to Maddie? Yeah, she says she thinks she has a better connection now, so we can give it another shot. Yeah, so try to connect to uh, a better internet source. So I hope, I hope that this works. Okay, so we need Tony to unshare. Okay. Okay, welcome back, Maddie. Awesome, okay, and so uh, I think that the last slide that you guys saw, um, does anybody remember that or should I start from the top? Whatever you guys think is best. Start where you left off. Okay, um, when, okay when did you guys last hear me? Because I think I cut out, you guys might've heard less than what I, did. Maybe start where you uh, discussed going to put cages around the plants this summer. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to go back to screen share. Okay, go back a couple. Okay. Yeah, so pull up my timer real quick. All right, so to get back to the challenges for the last six lupin, thank you guys so much for bearing with me. I'm really excited to share this with you guys. Um, so yeah, we've ex I've talked a little bit about the encroachment problems and how we've gone about trying to protect those seeds um, and how US Forest Service has done a lot to uh, essentially protect this entire population by caging those um, seeds. And so, um, Caging has been super beneficial, as I had mentioned. Uh, without caging, studies have shown that this population likely would have ex gone towards extinction or experienced extinction thus far. And so now, at this point, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the last six lupin and very specific fire interactions that have happened this far. Um, and so to do so, uh, this is a graph that I pulled from Sydney Carruthers 2019 Lassic Lupin report. Um, the top gray line is what I'll have you guys look at because this is what tracks the total adult population. Um, and so, yeah, a little bit about this. Basically, in 2013, the Lassics experienced a prolonged drought. It lasted until about 2015. And as you can see in the graph, um, th this definitely had negative implications for the population itself. And then by 2015, the Lassics experienced a fire. And this was called the Lassics fire. This is what I've pointed out here with the arrow in green. Um, and so, as you can see, the population was at a pretty low point here following that fire. Um, when the fire ripped through the Lassix, it killed a lot of adult mature plants, um, whether it be from the fire itself or latent heat and other fire-related injuries, um, the population definitely sustained a substantial loss. Um, and then following that, following the fire, it was pretty incredible. The drought let up and there was a wet winter in the Lassix. And following that wet winter, there was a prolific germination increase that was um, noted by a lot of people in 2016. And um, a lot of those seedlings, they actually were able to uh, survive and make it until 2017 to become a mature reproductive plant. So that's where we see here in 2017, this really large peak in the population. Um, so that's pretty exciting that that happened. And given this prolific increase in germination, um, there was definitely some interest in trying to understand the mechanisms at play and trying to understand if maybe the fire played a role in this. And so this pushes me into my objectives. Um, you know, 
Given the increased rate of the germination following the 2015 Lassix fire, as well as that short historic fire return interval, um, we wanted to understand if fire was playing a role in stimulating the germination of Lassix lupin. More specifically, we wanted to investigate two fire-related cues, heat and smoke. So the intention was to understand um, the relative importance of heat and smoke on the germination response of Lassix lupin. And given the small population size of this Lassix lupin, it is imperative to understand the mechanisms for germination to aid in future preservation of the population. And so how we did this, um, you know, we had to first obtain seeds, and this definitely was no easy feat, given the rarity of this species, uh, you know, only a small portion of the seeds each year can go to research. So a lot of seeds need to stay in the wild to help um, future regeneration. And then some seeds also need to go to seed banking to help with future preservation. Um, and then a small portion gets allocated to research. So in 2019, I was lucky enough to get my hands on 240 seeds, 120 came from the wild and 120 came from the Berkeley Botanical Garden. Um, some of my prior research on three different lupin species indicated that the best way to handle these germination experiment or handle this germination experiment would be to treat them um, in a sterile environment. So we wanted to reduce the risk of contamination or the addition of um, other confounding factors that could have influenced this germination response. So what we did was rinse the seeds prior to treatment um, and in hopes of rinsing the seed coat, what we thought could happen is um, we would dislodge any contaminants that would have attached themselves to that seed coat. So we rinsed them and then treated them under sterile conditions. So this is actually a picture of me working under a sterile hood um, with elastic loop and seeds. Um, I used heat treatments, smoke solution treatments, as well as an interaction treatment to compare to a control. The heat treatments uh, basically investigated putting these seeds into an oven at 80 degrees Celsius for an hour. That was, that was the first one. Um, and that's about 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Additionally, I did um, seeds in at 100 degrees Celsius, which is about 212 degrees Fahrenheit for five minutes. Um, I also utilized a smoke solution treatment. And what was really cool about the smoke solution is that um, I actually just made a dilutant solution out of smoke flavoring. So that's like smoke flavoring you can get at Safeway or whatever store that you like to use. Um, but it was pretty cool. So I was able to dilute that down to a one to 100 solution as well as a one to 500 solution. And those were dropped on the seeds to then initiate germination. Um, I also utilized an interaction treatment. And so we put those seeds in the oven at 80 degrees Celsius for an hour and then pulled them out and initiated germination with the one to 500 smoke solution. And as I had said earlier, these seeds needed to be treated um, as sterile as possible. And so they were treated individually. We uh, plated each seed into its own Petri dish. So you can see here in my pictures, that's each seed has its own little Petri dish. Um, and then once they were plated, we put them into a growth chamber at their ideal conditions. They spent 17 weeks in the growth chamber. And um, I know 17 is kind of a weird number. And the reason why they were only able to spend 17 weeks in the growth chamber was due to COVID-19 regulations. So um, 17 weeks into the experiment, COVID regulations hit and I was no longer able to access this facility to get in and continue checking on these seeds. Um, however, while they were in the growth chamber for those 17 weeks, they were checked on weekly. They were considered germinate, they were considered germinated upon a radical emergence of two millimeters. So here I've included a picture of a seedling. Um, and this was one that experienced the one to 100 smoke solution. This was from the Berkeley population right here, the one that's labeled number five. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. Um, it's got a nice, long, healthy radical, as well as two very healthy green cotyledons there. So that guy was considered germinated. Um, and to push into the results, I would like to preface by saying that, um, you know, as I talked about a little bit with COVID-19, um, I still have two more replications to complete for this experiment to be complete. So um, I did still want to include some preliminary results to show you guys what's happening with the population and um, the germination response with the addition of these cues. So this is a bar graph that I made. Um, the blue is indicative of the Berkeley population and this purple is indicative of the wild population. So right off the bat, 
we can see that Berkeley had a much higher response rate in comparison to the wild population. Um, and to review the results, the controls came in with the greatest response rate at 100%. Um, pretty hard to beat that. So um, the addition of smoke allowed for 70 to 80% germination. Low heat allowed for 50% germination, whereas high heat only had 10%. And then the interaction treatment had 50% germination. So to discuss a little bit about that, first I would like to address um, the response rate between Berkeley and the wild seed population. Um, so, you know, basically we saw that Berkeley responded at a much higher rate. And the question is why? What, what is at play here? And I would like to bring in, to, I would like everyone to think about the Lassix itself. The Lassix is a pretty extreme environment where these seeds are experiencing pretty harsh conditions. And so it could be that maybe these wild seeds have a much more protective seed coat. You know, they have a, a bit thicker of a seed coat um, or it could be that they have a greater dormancy and um, you know, maybe they need a more potent treatment to help break that dormancy to then release it and allow for germination. So that was what was going through my head with the Berkeley response rate being so high. Um, you know, those seeds aren't necessarily experiencing the hardships that the wild seeds are. So yeah, additionally, um, it could have been that they needed a little bit more time in the growth chamber. So the the seed, the wild seed that did germinate actually germinated after being in the growth chamber for 12 weeks. And given that they were only in there for 17 weeks, I think it would have been cool to see maybe after 25 weeks, how many of those wild seeds would have responded. And, um, you know, maybe in the future with those next two replications, that will be something that I can see. Additionally, I think it would be super beneficial to explore a wider spectrum of possibilities with additional seeds. So one thing that I wanted to look at was the effects of cold stratification. Um, and with additional, with additional seeds, I think that that would be something that should be looked at in the future. And now to address the role of fire, the question of fire, if it's affecting germination. Um, while we can't say definitively with hard evidence that these fire related cues are enhancing germination. What we can say is that germination definitely was not prevented with the addition of these cues. And I think that's rather exciting moving forward, seeing that those seeds were able to withstand um, heat related cues or fire related cues, such as smoke and heat. And so pushing forward into future research, um, Number one, I'm really excited to finish my last two replications and then move forward into data analysis to be able to see if we can say more definitively um, if fire is playing a role in germination for the last six lupin. Additionally, um, identifying the mechanisms of releasing dormancy to promote germination in the wild population. So again, as I had mentioned, the cold stratification, maybe trying to figure out if there's other things at play that would allow for the releasal of dormancy for those wild seeds. That's, you know, something that we should be focusing on in the future. Um, also, I think that investigating other potential cues would really behoove us. Um, you know, we know that there was an, there was a super wet winter following that Lassix fire. So it could be that maybe moisture is a really important cue in the germination of the Lassix lupin. Um, also, we know that that soil makeup is incredibly unique. Um, so it could be that there's something at play in the soil for the wild seeds, whether it be the soil chemistry or other symbionts that are playing a role and um, helping aid in the germination for the wild Lassix lupin. And so, yeah, with that in mind, I would just like to thank everybody for their time. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening, um, especially thank you to CNPS, the North Coast chapter for the funding and support in this project. Um, I would also would really like to thank Eric Jules for the opportunity to work with the Lassix Lupin. It's been incredible, as well as my lab assistants, Chris Collier and Sarah Norvell. You guys did an amazing job. Um, everybody else, thank you guys so much. All right. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah. That Thank was you. a whirlwind tour, but very interesting. It's great to see science in action. Um, I'm thinking 
Andrea, would this be a good time to look at some of the questions that people have asked before we go on to our last speaker? Yeah, well, it's fresh on our mind. I think so. So let me pull up the chat. Find the first question. Um, Maddie, one person, Griff, asked, when were you caging with the Forest Service? When were you caging the plants? Um, so I was able to do that in, I think it was July this year. So during the summer. Okay. Yes. Um, Jim asks, how long has the lupin been grown at Berkeley or how many generations or years have they had the seed? Right. So that's a great question, Jim. Um, that's actually something that I was curious about myself. Um, because as I had mentioned earlier, the Berkeley definitely responded much better to these treatments. And so that's something that I had thought about is, you know, how long have these plants been grown in the Berkeley Botanic Garden? And maybe if they're selecting the best plants year after year after year um, to then send in seeds for research. So maybe these seeds are just a little bit more readily available and, um, they're they don't have as great of a dormancy or as much of a protective seed coat just because they don't really need it in the Berkeley Botanic Garden. I think that's where you were going with that. At least that's where I hope you were going with that. Okay. Um, Robin asks, what about ash and water after the fire? Um, in terms of, so I guess that would kind of be, that would be more representative of the smoke solution, I, I think. So, um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean about ash and water after the fire. Like, do you mean how that's affecting future germinants or could you clarify that just a little bit more? Um, I'll move on with the other questions because I'm going in a row and then we'll see if Robin uh, clarifies their question. Sounds good. Uh, Brittany Long says, uh, they wonder if heat treated soil from fire had a different nutritional components um, that affected the plants? That is a very keen observation. And that would be something that would be super cool to study in future research, especially with additional seeds. Um, yeah, very, very good observation, Brittany. Um, Eli asks, um, are there other um, close relatives to the elastic lupin that have narrow ranges as well? Or do you have any thoughts as why their range is so um, narrow there? You know, mm, I, I don't really know exactly why it's so narrow, but I definitely think that there's um, some sort of association between the soil symbionts and the elastic lupin. So I don't know if maybe the given that the soil is made up of three different parent materials, maybe it's kind of dispersed in different areas. Um, so maybe certain soil symbionts are in specific areas of the lassics, but maybe not others. Um, so that could be a, re a reason why. But I also think that, um, well, there has, so there's two pop, there's two subpopulations. One is kind of in a more forested area. And that looks a lot different than the other area on Mount Lassic. Um, where the last, where the Lassic Slupin are inhabiting. And so it could be that, you know, maybe this just that area is just those soil symbionts are dispersed in different regions. But I do think it's important to note that there was a lot more duff and just a lot more like pine needles that had accumulated um, in the forest transects. So I don't know, but I, I would like to say that there could be other um, subpopulations out there that just haven't been identified yet. And if that's the case, that'd be awesome because it could add to our population or reported population, I guess. Okay. Um, and so Robin did clarify how the ash and water question they were asking, they mentioned that ash provides fertilizer and maybe how that affects its germination. Yeah, that would be amazing also to add into future research. Um, I think that would be really cool because one thing I did consider was actually making a true smoke solution where you create smoke by burning litter and then funneling that through water. And then that would be your solution that you would then use to initiate germination. So maybe that could be something as well. Um, utilizing something with ash or like once you burn that litter, um, adding that into the 
into the solution that you're initiating germination with that could act as a fertilizer. But we would need more, we would need additional seeds to investigate that. Okay. Um, so William asked, does Berkeley have a specific preparation reg uh, regimen for germinating? That is another really great question. I don't know a whole lot about what Berkeley is doing um, to keep this population going or how they're going about maintaining these plants, but that is something that I would really like to know. So it, with future research, if, if I'm able to continue, I would definitely love to reach out to the Berkeley Botanic Gardens and see what they're doing with those seeds or just with the plants in general. I think, um... We better move on with Sydney. Are there a lot more questions, Andrea? Um, there is one could... last comment about a, a lupin, a baker lupin, lupin has a tiny disappearing population as well near Covello. Oh, that's another narrow range lupin. Very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, were there any questions for Tony? Yes. Um, so CJ asks, are you there, Tony? Affirmative. All right. Yes. Are there any places along your route that are crying out for special conservation stat uh, action? I would say that's a great question, CJ. And it's important because I didn't really, you know, I was giving you guys a snapshot of, of some flora that uh, we saw this spring, but overall, that area, it's dead center of the Emerald Triangle. <laughs> and it has suffered greatly from fragmentation. I would say that your, your forested areas, as Carol was alluding to, cannabis in any of those uh, oak woodland prairie areas, there's no one special area in, in, that I can call out uh, besides some place like Rancho Sequoia, uh, up, up slope of Alder Point. Some of those areas are, uh, they've been subdivided and cut into little parcels. That's overwhelmingly across much of that area. And uh, Maddie's presentation kind of focuses on areas that are within the Six Rivers National Forest. Thankfully, many of those areas are protected and are being managed. You know, I, I can't call anything out CJ, but I would say overall conservation of those habitats is probably something that folks want to focus on going forward. Um, I had one question for you, Tony. And the, mm -hmm. the image of your, I think it was a Shelton's violet. Were those the violet's leaves, the deeply lobed leaves? Yeah, two of those species I showed, uh, Shelton's and Douglasii, have twice pinnate compound leaves. Cool. Yeah, I've only seen an ID books. So I haven't seen a violet with those kind of leaves. Yeah, you'll find uh, those. And then there's that, uh, there's one more sometimes in that area. I see uh, the moose horn shape. I'm not sure, I forgot what species that is. <laughs> but there's some, uh, simple entire leaves, there's compound leaves, there's lobed leaves. It's really interesting, the diversity in uh, viola. Okay. It's all been good, but we still have one more exciting speaker who's been very patient, but um, Sydney Larson is uh, a name that I found on our CMPS Facebook group where people can post their flower pictures. And she posted some pictures of the flowers that I find the most exciting. The um, things that have no chlorophyll. So um, we used to call them saprophytes and now we call them mycoheterotrophs. And uh, so when I was thinking of whose pictures I would like to see on this December program, I thought of her and I managed to find a way to contact her. And luckily uh, we have Sydney here tonight to share these photos with her. She's done great as an amateur naturalist during COVID. Her career had nothing to do with plants, but she's learning a lot. Okay, Sydney. Okay. Oh. 
not sure. So as as Carol said, um, I I worked a career in early childhood education and college teaching, and other than than hiking and looking at flowers and saying, oh, those are interesting, um, didn't really wasn't really obsessed, but post retirement and then COVID. Um, Mark, my husband and I decided that we were first going to walk every single trail in the Arcata community forest, which given the length of COVID didn't take long. And so we started branching out to other trails that we hadn't hiked before. So Hope Creek Trail, which is actually two, two trails. I mean, it's, it's a loop, but it's got two names, Hope Creek and Tin Typo Trail is in Prairie Creek. And this is the map from the, the park. It's 3.6 miles. It's got some significant uphill. But when you get uphill is when you start finding really magical things. Um, so when I really like this term pop out effect because it, it basically talks about that you don't see something until you start seeing it. And after you see it, then you see it. So one of the magical things that we found was this pine sap, and this is it on June 13th. And another view. All of these pictures were taken with an iPhone. I didn't, I don't use a, a SLR. And then we went back again a week later to see if they looked different. And they didn't look very, very different in a week or in a week and a half. But then we went back on July 21st and they looked radically different. So another one that I love this one, the, the gnome plant, which we did not seem to change much again. And then we did not see that again in, in July. The fringe pine sap became, we saw more of it as the season went on. Pacific coral root was in, um, all stages all through the time period that we hiked. After the July date, um, the park was opened again and the tourists were there in force and we stopped going until recently. <laughs> but the coral roots um, were both dying and starting through the whole time we were there. I love this one. It's, I, I haven't been able to find any information to clarify the difference between the, the pine saps. I mean, clearly there is one, but I don't know what it is. Um, so this is it in July, which is, and then I just wanted to share this lovely Ansel Adams quote about becoming sensitive. So as children, we're very sensitive to nature's beauty, finding miracles and interesting things everywhere. As we grow up, we tend to forget how beautiful and magnificent the world is. There is magic and wonder for eyes who know how to look with curiosity and love. And that's it. Well, you did a good job with your curiosity and love and your iPhone. That's really cool that you went back and got them at different stages. Yeah, I did want to go back again, but as I said, by then the, the um, influx of non-mask wearing tourists was such that we decided to forego exposure. Yeah. 
So uh, one thing you could see really clearly in your photos is that uh, some of those plants are in the family Ericaceae. And those are the ones that have the, the round stigma in the middle of the flower. So it's a regular shaped flower with a stigma in the middle. Whereas the coral root is an orchid and has that the strange orchid shaped flower. So those are two different families that have um, gone the route of losing chlorophyll and taking advantage of a fungus that's mycorrhizal with the trees around it. Did yeah. you notice, notice uh, these plants being under certain kinds of trees? You know, we, we kind of realized after the fact that we should have paid attention to that because yes, they were, um, but you know, I was so on my hands and knees doing micro work that it didn't occur to me to get broader photographs. So next year, next year we'll have to do that. Primarily redwoods, though, because it, it is in an old growth area in Prairie Creek. Well, you, you did mention that you start seeing these when you get up the hill. Yes. And I, I think and that's true. And, and then it levels out. And then when you go back down, you don't see them. So it's a fairly, it's right at the top. It's, it's at the top. Yeah, it's at the top and it's where there's the least undergrowth. You know, yeah. you don't find them where there's salal all over the place. Right, yeah. And you have to be willing to crawl around a little bit. I mean, you can, all of these you could see from the trail. None of them were far off the trail, but to really get a good view of them, you have to be willing to get your elbows and knees muddy. Tony, do you have anything to add to this discussion about mycoheterotrophs? I know you've you've paid attention to this group. Was that a question to me, Carol? Yeah, I know you know something about mycoheterotrophs. Well, it's surprising. That was a great suite of uh, discoveries, Sydney. Thank you. Did you see any ghost pipe? Any pure white? No, no, I, I saw, I've seen pictures of them and was hoping to see some, but yeah, they eluded. It looks like you saw the other, other representative there, the Monotropa hypopodes though. That was another good find. Yeah. Um, I think it's really difficult. Taking photos of the canopy is a great idea for your observations. But what, what some folks have found, the fung, fungus, the, the people who study those kind of things, is it's pretty complex underground. And we have, it's challenging trying to figure out, standing on top of everything, you know, what's going on under there and which plants are connected to which fungi, which are connected to which trees. Predominantly, though, we know redwoods aren't usually the ones. And so right. we were looking when you're looking at uh, Douglas fir and hemlock and spruce and grand fir and all the other components of the forest, those are largely the ones that are driving those, those uh, associations that you see, those relationships. And it's pretty amazing so much we don't know about them. And then and, and the whole discussion of whether they're uh, taking advantage of something or whether they're just doing their part or whether somebody gets a benefit. Those are so complicated, those questions that we're still struggling to answer them. And how do they propagate? Uh, both of those are plants that are flowering plants that have uh, that propagate by seed. Both, both of those sets, right? As Carol was alluding to the fact that the ericaceous things uh, disperse tiny little dust like seeds, so the orchids for that matter, right, Carol? Most of those seeds are incredibly small. And right. they do not germinate unless the fungus, fungal associate is present. So that's another unique aspect of what's going on there. So there's your next challenge to photograph the underground parts of these plants. <laughs> 
Well, I'm, I'm hesitant to uh, do any damage to the plant in, in uh, order to learn more about it. If there were many, 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 I guess I might be willing, but when there's so few, I don't want to harass them. Right. I thought maybe your iPhone had a setting that would look through the, right. through the soil. That's probably the next edition and the 13. I think we all hope for that someday that we just wave our phone over the plant and it tells us you know, what it is genetically and we don't have to do any work anymore. <laughs> we just know intuitively what plants these are by the help of our electronic chip and our brain. Well, I natural okay. life is good, but it's not that good yet. Yeah, Sydney says Sydney says that iNaturalist helped her identify these. And we're thinking of using iNaturalist as the collection platform for our 2021 wildflower show. So it's it's um, a website to get familiar with. So um, Andrea, were there any questions for Sydney? Yeah, uh, Griff asks, what is your, your favorite mycohenotrope and why? Oh gosh, <laughs> I really like the gnome plant. They're just so um, sort of mystical and unassuming. They just are there low to the ground and not making a big flashy statement, just if you take the time to look at them, they're just lovely. That's the hematomies, correct? That yes. Right? Um, yes. Sydney, um, Jennifer asked, she's wondering uh, if anyone knows, I guess, what pollinates plants like these, like perhaps the Ericaceae or orchids have specific pollinators. I have no clue. We didn't see any. Yeah, we never we never saw any insects on them. And since Mark's brother's an entomologist, we're always looking for insects to take photographs of. So we didn't see that while we were there. Tony's going to tell us though. In the past, we've seen bumblebees in some of our um, ericaceous heteromycotrophs, but I, I would, folks on this call know better than I what's going on in the orchid world. I'm sure there's a whole suite of ice critters that are crawling around in those orchid flowers, Corallariza. So if, if anybody knows something about pollinators of these, um, use your chat to tell Andrea that you can talk about it. And I'll add that um, Sydney mentioned that gnome plant is one of those very humble um, type plants that just sort of pokes out of the ground as far as it has to go. In my mind, they're sort of the mushroom version of a vascular plant. Well, there's another species up there. Um, I think it's more at the bottom of the Hope Creek Trail that Gary Lester found, and he, he found pine foot there. That's the Pityopus, which is yet another mycoheterotroph from that area. It just, it makes it a really rich area and must be really special. So, Um, there was one comment that when Emily saw gnome plant in Umpqua National Forest, uh, it was heavily visited by ants, but not sure what's pollinating, but it was very uh, popular with the ants. That's a good observation. The gnome plant is right down there where the ants can get at it. And uh, David, uh, mentioned the fungal partner of the gnome plant is 
uh, a really beautiful fungus called Hidnellum pecii. Ah, very good. So where, where else have these been seen in our area? They must be other places. Well, when, a place that I've seen a number of them, a good number is in the um, white fir forest around Cold Spring up in Six Rivers National Forest. So that's up getting to be around 4,000 feet. And um, just downhill from the spring, there's a, there's a really dense white fir forest where there's nothing in the undergrowth. And depending what time of year you go there, there's a lot of the, the uh, phantom orchids. And I've also seen the uh, pine sap there. And I'm not, let's see, I'm not remembering it. Well, I think I've seen three or four species of the mycoheterotrophs there. Jennifer has a good comment uh, that you can use iNaturalist to look for other people's observations by genus and family. And you can see where there other people are seeing those same plants or organisms. Right. Um, one, one of the species that Tony mentioned that Sydney did not show is the um, the Indian pipe, what do we call it? The ghost pipe. Monotropa. Monotropa, the yeah. one that's got a single flower that droops. Anyhow, uh, there's a fairly famous patch of them up near the top of that trail, that other trail in Prairie Creek State Park. It's got, um, you can go up Browns Creek and then come down this ridge. It's something ridge trail that goes, it goes straight up from um, Parkway on the east side. And when you're getting up near the top, that's where you see the, the uh, ghost orchid, the ghost um, pipe. It wouldn't be white at this time of year, but it's, it does hang in there with a, um, the old brown stalks. So you could see it, I think, all year. Okay, I think... Um, if people want to stay and talk more, that's okay, but we'll call this meeting officially over. Thank you everyone for coming. It was all three speakers were really fun and you were a great audience and everybody was adaptable to, um, especially Maddie, to find a new way to connect to the internet. And we'll hope to see you again in January. Thank you, Carol, for a wonderful, for a wonderful evening. Thank you, Maddie. Thanks for the invite, Carol. And thank you, Tony. That was really interesting and beautiful and inspiring. We're ready for spring right now. All right. Thank and you, thank Carol. You. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. I hope to see you in, in the real sometime. Someday we're gonna have real life again. Right. Thanks. Yeah. And Andrea, thank you for um, moderating or hosting and handing all the handling all the clicks. All the clicks. Yeah, I'm glad I could make it. Yeah, you've had a long day. Ah, oh, there are the waters. Hi, Jim in Virginia. Glad you made it.
Okay, everybody have a safe trip home. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Linda. <laughs>